So in interest of time, I probably am going to go a little bit fast uh, over some of the cases, and then so we have some time for discussion. Um, and some of the initial part of the talk is like basic, uh, how you uh, evaluate patients with instability, and then later on it's more complex uh, instability cases. So um, I'll get started. Uh, uh, I have no disclosures. I'm from uh, Cincinnati Children's Hospital. We start with uh, case number uh, one, 13 year old girl who was walking downstairs and twisted her knee and felt the patella dislocate and relocate. This was her first dislocation. She had no contralateral knee issues and she has no family history. On examination, she had no effusion. She had some tenderness over the medial aspect of the patella. Her translation is two quadrants, uh, medial and lateral. She has a positive apprehension sign. Biton score is three out of nine. That's the score that we commonly use to gauge uh, hyperlaxity. Her standing alignment is neutral and her prone rotational profile is normal. And for the sake of the presentation, these are no, no curve balls here. So if, uh, if I'm not mentioning any measurements, they are assumed to be normal. Uh, these are the x-rays of uh, the patient. Uh, so the first thing I would like to have a comment uh, from, from any of the panel members is, do you think this is an adequate uh, x-ray series? Would you order anything more? James? So first, ask the radiographer to do a proper lateral x-ray because a lot of time they do it in this manner. You see that in various vulgus is not uh, properly aligned, the condyles, although in rotation is okay here. Then, of course, sometimes you can add on the skyline view as well. Okay, so two comments which, were, which are very appropriate is to get a perfect lateral, and I'll explain you why you need a perfect lateral x-ray to evaluate patients, and then you also need a merchant view. So perfect lateral x-ray is defined by the overlap of the posterior condyles, and distally the condyles should overlap as well. When you have perfect lateral x-rays, you'll be able to see a lot of risk factors for instability. For example, if you see a crossing sign from the, from the trochlear sign, which is the extension of the Blumen set or the intercondylar notch sign, so if this line, when you extend it, that's the trochlea. When that trochlear line intersects, with the condylar line, it's called a positive cro uh, crossing sign, which is a sign for trochlear dysplasia. The other line is a line along the anterior femoral cortex, and you measure the bump, and if it's more than four or five millimeters, depending on what study you, uh, you, are, you are coating, then that is a supratrochlear bump. And the third thing is a double contour here, which you see a parallel shadow, but every extra you see has to be perfectly lined up to make all these assessments. And it's important, even if you're not gonna be treating the trochlear dysplasia, it's a risk factor, so your chances of having a redislocation or failure of conservative treatment are based on the amount of risk factors you have. So it's important for you to make sure this double contour signif signifies you have a hypoplastic medial condyle. And then you measure the patellar height on this, there are various indices to measure patellar height, and, uh, and uh, you can also uh, uh, look at the uh, MRI to correlate your x-ray findings. As if you want to get a perfect lateral x-ray, you have to speak with your radiologist, and this is the way we do it. We put a sponge or something underneath the leg to level the leg is in line with the knee joint, and then you just uh, uh, about 10 degree tilt of the gantry, and you get a perfect lateral x-ray every time. Uh, as far as the uh, axial view is concerned, this is the axial view of the patient. So you can see a little bit of an avulsion from the medial side. As far as the axial views are concerned, what you want to make sure is that it's a proper merchant view, which is taken uh, at a 30 degree angle with the knee flex 45 degrees. And how do you know that this is a good axial view? Is that the ratio of the lateral facet to the medial facet is usually one to two ratio. Then you are evaluating the proximal aspect of the trochlea. If they are equal, that means that it's for the flexion. It's, it's in around 45 degrees or more flexion. And then you don't get to evaluate the trochlea because trochlear dysplasia is mainly present in the proximal part of the trochlea. So you want to make sure that you get a good axial view at low degrees of flexion. So this is a good axial view. On the MRI, you can see characteristic bone bruises, which are of this patient, and we don't see any osteochondral fracture. So in short, this patient is a first-time patellar dislocation, has a small marginal fracture here. So what I would like to know from the panel is how you're going to treat this patient. So these are your options. Conservative treatment, whether you repair the avulsed fragment and attached structures, whether you'll do a proximal distal realignment, including um, a lateral release, or whether you, you would do an MPFL reconstruction. So I'd like the panel to just uh, uh, tell their preferences. I think being a child uh, with a small avulsed fragment, this could heal very well. 
All we need to do is immobilize this for a period of two or three weeks in a posterior splint. And uh, following that three week period, we start with aggressive physio rehabilitation recovery of uh, quadriceps strength, especially the vastus medialis. Excellent. Uh, if the, uh, the patient continues to have instability later, then we could probably consider intervention. Anyone uh, is going to differ from uh, the uh, suggestion given by the panel? So I think uh, most of us do agree. Yeah, Just make ahead. sure that your that a valve fragment is not intraarticular, and in this case, the X-ray is quite nice. Otherwise, you might need an MRI to look at. Right. Extent. So, the, so the couple of points that are made is that if you go back and look at the X-ray, you want to make sure that this fracture is not intraarticular. For that to be intraarticular, it is usually a bigger piece, and then you can evaluate on the MRI whether it has a chondral surface attached to it, because that then it becomes an osteochondral fracture, not just a marginal fracture. But the treatment for a first-time dislocation uh, in in a young patient uh, who otherwise has no other uh, uh, issues, it is a conservative treatment protocol. And uh, the treatment protocol is to immobilize it for a few weeks. Uh, you can be weight-bearing as tolerated. And after about uh, three weeks, you can do, uh, start with physical therapy, concentrating on the core, progressing down towards the hip and the quads. And then you, we use a Palumbo brace, and the return to sports can be in 6 to 12 weeks based on functional tests and how the patient is doing. Now, a first-time dislocation with no osteochondral fracture, is there any role for surgery? Do you ever have to operate on these patients? So I can tell you that if you look at the fate of the patella after the first-time dislocation, you, it's a one-third rule. So one-third of the patients are going to be normal, one-third may re-dislocate again, and one-third are symptomatic. That means they may not dislocate, but they may have persistent instability. Now, how do we recognize this group? Is there a way to predict that this patient is, having, is going to have issues because then you can change the treatment? So there are certain algorithms that you can use. One of them is the instability severity score that has been published and it's a list of these things. You look at the age, whether they are bilateral or they had contralateral history, whether they have trochlear dysplasia, their height of the patella, the TTTG, and the tilt. So these six parameters would give you a score, and if you have more than four points, then the risk of dislocation is almost four times more than you have less than four points. The other thing is we looked at the predictors of recurrent instability and found these four predictors, if they're immature, if they have contralateral dislocation, if they have trochlear dysplasia, and if they have patella alta, if they have four risk factors, then the risk of recurrence is 88%. And so we, we offer surgery to some patients if they have a history of contralateral issues and have high-grade dysplasia, then even after first-time dislocation, we would recommend uh, surgical treatment. So there is a role in a very small subset of patients if you can recognize them early on. We'll go on to the second case, a 16-year-old boy who twisted and fell during dancing. This is first-time patellar dislocation as well. No family history. The contralateral knee is normal. There is significant effusion. There is global tenderness to palpation. You could not examine the patient very well because there is effusion. And there is guarding, and the Biton score is 4 out of 9. This is the uh, x-rays of the patient. And as I said, there are no hidden things here. What you can see here is a big osteochondral fragment. Okay? When you see an x-ray like this with a big uh, piece of bone, there is cartilage attached to it, so the size of the big, uh, piece is actually bigger than what you can see. So, and the MRI shows that this piece has come out from the, from the patella here, and you can see the big piece lying here in the center, and it's the inferior half of the patella. So it's a significant size piece. So my questions to the panel is that first-time dislocation with an osteochondral fracture, what are the options for the osteochondral fragment? Are you going to ignore the fragment? It's 15 millimeters in its widest dimension. Whether you're going to remove the loose piece and microfracture the bed, which is from the patella, or the, whether you're going to internally fix this fragment. And then if you're going to do surgery to fix it, are you going to do anything for instability? Are you going to treat the instability conservative? Are you going to do a repair? a reconstruction or a stage reconstruction. So let me just ask the panel for the first uh, thing. Uh, for the osteochondral fragment, uh, what would be your recommended treatment? And any one of you, yes. So uh, we really can't ignore this situation. It's a large piece, as you mentioned. So it would need to be addressed. The question remains whether one could be able to fix it or do we have to just uh, throw it off and use some sort of a, a microfracture type of technique to reconstruct the bed? So okay. that would be the thought process. Okay, agreed. Uh, is there a particular size that anyone would go by, like, you know, some says 12, 15, 20, or you would just look at the piece in trap and then decide? Correct. Just look at the piece and then take a decision. Okay. The next question is, if you're going to fix it, are you going to do anything about the instability or are you going to fix it and then treat it conservative? 
No, for a first time uh, dislocator, I would not uh, do anything surgically for that. I would just uh, treat it with uh, good physiotherapy, and should it recur, then I would perhaps address it. Okay. Does anyone, uh, does James or Ted, do you do anything different? Uh, if you're going to go in to fix this fragment, would you do anything about the instability? So, um, <clears throat> one slight caveat is I, I do check there, some of these people that with patellar dislocations have a massive amount of effusion and a very stiff knee, so you want to make sure you address stiffness to start. A stiff knee going into a surgery can be a stiff knee going out, so you, you'd like to get some motion back for those folks. Um, and uh, I fix what's fixable, I, do not, I remove what is not fixable, and I tend to, if they have lots of risk factors, then I like to uh, do whatever means is appropriate to fix that, whether it's patellofemoral ligament or whether it's tubercle plasty. So, so in those that are high risk for recurrent dislocation, I want to protect the repair. So that's the one exception I will have to that rule. Okay. All right. So, uh, so a lot of good points. So, you know, you have to look at the cartilage, uh, you know, the quality of the cartilage, the size of the piece when you get that. The one thing everyone would recommend is not to ignore this because this is a big piece from, you know, it's almost the medial aspect and the inferior aspect of the, of the patella. So that everyone agrees. As far as the options for instability, our uh, algorithm is to do an MPFL reconstruction since we are there, but we would like to do it in a stage fashion and I'll, I'll show you what our protocol has been. We do stage MPFL reconstruction for these patients. Uh, this is the, um, uh, the, the arthroscopy. You can see that there is also damage to the lateral femoral condyle, but most of the time lateral femoral condyle are in the non-weight-bearing area, so you can ignore them, but if they are coming into the weight-bearing area, then you have to treat it. This is a defect on the patellar side, and, um, and so what we did is uh, fix the, uh, um, the patella with, uh, with these metal screws, and because these screws are intra-articular, I would like to remove them. I usually remove them at, uh, at around three months, and when I'm going to remove them, then I go back, I mean, at the same time, I would do an MPFL reconstruction, but there are options. If you use bioabsorbable or sutures or something to repair this fragment, and if you choose to treat it conservative, then that is your choice. But the, the bottom line is to not ignore the fragment and fix it. Does anyone have a different way of fixing these fractures? Uh, Shita, I, I found the difference in trend in North America seem to be a lot more metal intra-articular uh, screw fixation, but outside North America seem to be more bioabsorbable screw. Yeah, is that the any explanation for this? So, you know, our experience, I've, I've, I've used the bioabsorbable implants before. The biomechanical studies have shown the best compression and biomechanical stability you can get from these screws, uh, the headless screws, compared to the bioabsorbable pins that you use. But clinically, that might not be relevant. Clinically, it may still heal. The other issue is that I like the screws because I can see if they're going to back out, whereas with the bioabsorbable pins, if they ever back out or if they cause any uh, you know, uh, synovitis or effusion, you don't know if it's a pin that is backing out and causing injury to the other side. So I like to see these fragments, and I like to go back in after three months to evaluate that fragment has healed well. It's two surgeries, but I tell the patients up front, and so far, you know, and the reason to do a, a state surgery is because this is a medial approach. It's on the medial side, so I don't want to do an MPFL and then go through the MPFL to remove the screws. So I go in the second time, do a medial arthrotomy, take out the screws, make sure, make sure it's, uh, it's well healed, and then I would do an MPFL reconstruction. But there is, there is variation in the treatment protocols for this approach. So I'm not advocating that this is the only way to treat it, but this, is, this has been our protocol. Uh, so three months later, went in, the fragment had healed, not perfectly, but it is, it is, you know, I checked and make sure that it is perfectly, uh, I mean, perfectly at least fixed to the, uh, to the bed. You can still see that it's not perfectly healed here at the margins. And then I would do an MPFL reconstruction at the same time so that I don't have to ever go back in. Uh, the reason to, f to remove the screws, you can see this is another case early on in my practice where I left the screws inside and the patient started complaining of pain. When I went in, there was a, this track. This is the... Uh, this is a tibiofemoral joint, it's not patellofemoral, but the, that's the reason to remove the screws. Intraarticular screws, I would not leave them alone. And my problem with the bioabsorbable fixation is that if something like this happens when your bioabsorbable screw backs out, you cannot see it, you don't know what's going on, unless you do an MRI and it's not very reliable. But, it's, uh, but this is, I think, personal preference of what you choose to fix, uh, fix the uh, fragment. So I would not do a medial side repair because historically isolated lateral release and medial sided repairs even these are all 
level one studies, they randomized trials, repair versus no repair, and none of them have shown superiority of a medial repair over no, no repair. So I would, if I'm going to do anything, I would do MPFL reconstruction. I would not try to repair the torn structures. And you know, initially you used to do it for the first uh, few years in the practice, and we found the same results that they would their recurrence rate after repair is the same as not doing anything. Uh, case three is a 10-year-old female, acute episode of patellar dislocation, three previous patellar dislocations. So this is a case of recurrent dislocations, low energy mechanisms, no pain between episodes, no effusion, full range of motion, bilateral apprehension, hyperlaxity, genu valgum, and a rotational profile that was normal. These are the x-rays of this patient. The only thing is that there is dysplasia. You can see a, a crossing sign. You can see a little bit of uh, a spur. Growth plates are wide open. and um, and this is the uh, a skeletally immature patient. This is the uh, genu valgum. So we always get a full stand, uh, full standing X-rays. If they have clinically, they have any uh, any alignment issues, we would like to measure it. And um, and the MRI shows no significant tearing, but stretching um, uh, on the medial side, and um, no other issues, no other fractures in the joint. Um, and so this is a recurrent dislocation, skeletally immature patient. Genu valgum is a risk factor. So the options are whether you're going to do a conservative treatment and then do surgery only if it failed, whether you'll do an MPFL reconstruction, whether you do a medial sided repair or imbrication, or whether you'll do an isolated lateral retinacular release. So, Ted? Um, I was uh, checking on our schedule, so I'm going to defer to Dr. Wee there. James, what do you? Oh, sorry. Okay. Um, so, that's, uh, this is a very skeletally immature child, and I feel that perhaps we can do some growth modulation, uh, like, like you say, uh, and may or may not require MPFL reconstruction at that moment. Uh, the reason is uh, I happened to just publish only a very small series, nine cases in CASTA recently, and we found that with that guided growth, actually, we managed to uh, reduce the recurrent dislocation rate. Good point. You know, there have been some papers suggesting that if you correct genu valgum, then you don't need to stabilize the patella. They would stabilize by itself. Um, however, uh, we would choose the MPFL reconstruction. That has been the protocol, but, uh, but we would correct the genu valgum in a skeletally mature patient uh, because it doesn't take too much to correct it. it I will just for the sake of time, I'll go over these slides quickly. We'll do MPFL reconstruction. The graft options, I use gracilis autograft, but studies have not shown uh, any significant difference what graft you use. Uh, I use a posterior, posterior medial approach to harvest the uh, graft. It's cosmetic, and I can avoid injury to the uh, saphenous nerve branch. It doesn't affect my rehab. Um, so the systematic review did not show um, any difference uh, in autograft, allograft, or synthetic graft. Uh, and the only thing it showed is that the adductor tendon had a little bit higher rate of uh, recurrent instability. Um, and then, again, a second paper showed no difference in recurrent instability between autograft and allograft. A failure rate was less with double limb graft. So for the sake of time, I would just finish this case, and then we'll, uh, it will take me a couple of minutes, and then we'll move on to um, uh, the next speaker. So patellar tunnel placement, you know, when we were drilling across like this, we had uh, incidences of fracture. So we modified the technique, and in the last 200 cases, we have not had any uh, fractures when we use the technique like this. So we drill from medial to lateral for about a centimeter, and then we come uh, from top. Uh, about one centimeter. So you have a bone bridge of about one centimeter. We don't use any implants on the patellar side, um, and uh, that has uh, uh, decreased uh, or eliminated the rate of uh, fracturing of the patella. We just uh, uh, use a curette to chamfer the, um, the sharp margins of the uh, tunnel. We use uh, a needle to pass a suture, and then we pass the graft with a loop at the end of the suture. So. Um, uh, and we then uh, tie the two ends uh, of the uh, of the graft, just whip stitch them, and so this is a gracilis tendon, 3.5 millimeter tunnel, um, and do not cross the midline. As far as the femoral tunnel fixation is concerned, we looked at the complications, and the commonest complication is anterior placement. So we always use fluoroscopy to evaluate these uh, the attachment point. If you're going to do open uh, surgeries, you can use the adductor magnus because it's just distal to the insertion of adductor magnus. Um, tendon um, and uh, use uh, fluoroscopy to make sure that on the lateral it may appear that you are on the physis, but on the AP you would be below the level of the physis. So um, these are the studies. Uh, this is. Uh, I think we are running out of time. So. 
Okay, all right. So, uh, you know, your attachment uh, points uh, that, uh, that I showed you uh, uh, were, um, uh, were on the physis on a lateral view and below the physis. And final assessment, uh, you want to make sure that you're not too tight in extension. When I fix the graft, I keep the knee in about 60 degrees of flexion so that the patella is in the trochlea. But you want to check in extension and make sure that the, uh, the patella has at least one or two quadrants of mobility. You don't have to pull it so much that you create an itrogenic medial instability. And then you check with an arthroscope mainly to make sure that the MPFL is positioned intra-articularly because that's important. And you can see the functioning in knee extension, the MPFL is taut because that is when it's working. When you flex the knee, the patella gets captured in the trochlea and your MPFL graft loosens up a little bit that you would see when I'm flexing the knee. You can see that now the MPFL graft doesn't, is not that taut. So it's an isometric functioning when you check intra-op. All right, and so isolated MPFL reconstruction is not for habitual dislocations. Uh, this is a habitual dislocation inflection. You should, the graft would fail or stretch out if you do it for such conditions. Uh, same way, it's not for um, uh, someone who has a permanent dislocation, like this patient has permanently dislocated uh, the, uh, the patella. It is not meant for these uh, cases. Um, if we have time, I'll show you, we have one more case of uh, habitual dislocation, how we treat or approach those cases. In sake, for the sake of time, I'm just gonna stop after this case. You should not do it for pain, arthrosis, and if you have deformities, you need to correct the deformities. So for genu valgum, our, our criteria is if it's more than five degrees compared to the other side, we'll do guided growth, and for osteotomies, the criteria is a little bit stringent. So we would do, it, do an osteotomy only if it's more than 10 degrees. For this case, we did, uh, uh, I use a transficial screw for the, uh, for the hemiepiphysiodesis, and you can see uh, the, uh, the placement of the screw, and then you can see the correction in, uh, within a year. And we published our first series of uh, seven patients that are treated with, uh, uh, with a transficial screw along with MPFL in JPO just recently. Um, so I'll just uh, st uh, stop right here. We'll see if we have time, we'll go over the uh, other case. Thank you.